Aaron, how are you, man? How are you doing? Hey, Carlos, what's going on? Thank you for having me. It's, it's always weird to be greeting people <laughs> on the podcast <laughs> after I've just been talking to them for 10 minutes before we get started. It's very interesting, the whole strategy of talking into the podcast and then starting the podcast such that you continue the flow from the previous conversation, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's a whole thing on its own. But well, for, I mean, people are seeing that in the title of the video right now. People know this, but for those that don't, Aaron is the CEO of Promethium, a new project that's basically a platform to issue tokenized securities and there is a lot to unpack in there so would you like to take it from there explain a bit what it is that you guys do and then we'll just ask away sure so Promethium is a ecosystem creating an ecosystem that allows for the issuance trading clearing settlement excuse me clearing and processing of digital assets compliantly under the federal securities laws Uh, the way you have to think of that, the first component is a issuance and distribu distribution process where a token is created and it's distributed to brokerage accounts, which are digital wallets. Uh, then those assets are listed on a secondary market, an a alternative trading system, and they're processed and settled at Anchorage, our custodian. Uh, so basically, we create the ecosystem that allows for the full life cycle of a digital asset under the federal securities laws of the United States. What is um, yeah? What prompted you to do that? I know that you have a Wall Street background. Sure. So there's two components to that. One is the basically uh, creating an ecosystem for digital assets that basically is compliant. And our perspective is twofold. One, the federal securities laws provide the best framework that allows for the regulation of digital assets in the United States. It allows for investor protection full and fair disclosure and fair and orderly markets, which is really important in order for digital assets to go mainstream. And two, uh, as long as someone is actually using those methodologies to comply with the federal securities laws, you don't have to really worry about compliance. So by introducing the compliant component and the compliant pathways, you're basically creating a pathway by which a blockchain company can compliantly issue a digital asset, by which that digital asset can compliantly trade. And then basically uh, the goal is for that digital asset also to be utilized in the distributed economy, I meaning to also potentially have some utility value uh, in a different blockchain or in some use case specifically. And, and I understand that for these, you guys are also like developing your own, your own blockchain, right? That you're not utilizing anything that's already out there. Uh, well, that's sort of true, but sort of not. Essentially, we, we use the substrate framework and then we customize it to meet our needs. Uh, we're not... <laughs> The beauty of the blockchain space is there's a lot of really good tech. And if you know what's good out there, you can utilize that and customize it to basically uh, leverage distributed architectures and distributed technology in general. Uh, for a company to create their own blockchain is, you know, uh, it, 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 it's a Sisyphean task. It's a really big task because particularly if you're launching a public blockchain, like if you look at what like Polkadot did, when you launch that test network, you have to build up that test network for a very long time until it reaches stability. So just to launch a public blockchain, I, it's just for a company to say, though, we're going to launch a public blockchain, uh, unless they have significant funding and really have a clear pathway, uh, it, it could appear as a pipe dream. Well, what about, the, what about the road of a public, of a private blockchain? I mean, I, mean I, I understand that most people would think that a private blockchain sort of like defeats the whole purpose of blockchains. Is a uh, private blockchain a blockchain? <laughs> I, 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 would, I, would, I wouldn't think so, but I, I'm, I've had to talk to people that think so. so I always have to. I always have to. Leave you know what I'm room. saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, like, listen. Um, again, the next question to that—that that is a private blockchain. A blockchain is how many validators do you need in order to have a real blockchain? Like, what's the minimum number to have a public blockchain? Right. Like it's a, these are interesting concepts, more like the, the like philosophical sense as opposed to the specific tech components there. But like, uh, you know, I've heard the argument that in order to be a, a real chain, you need 100 validators or 100 miners because then you have distribution. You can't have centralization, that type of thing, you know, but uh, it's interesting more in the like the general, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, have a couple of drinks and discuss the. Uh, the molecular components of blockchain side, you know? I mean, if you go look 
deep enough uh, and if, if you go high enough some people would say that there's even like with the biggest blockchain of course that's bitcoin if you look high enough you get to see that at the very top you would only need to attack attack a set of i don't want to screw up the number that my guest i don't even remember who said this but like uh, one of my guests was saying that it was basically something between 100 and 200 people that you would have to attack which is a low enough number that's if you count that one gpu one vote but then most people own that more than one gpu etc etc but look at it this way there's always going to be whales that control things in life yeah right so if you chose the top 100 people on wall street and said that they were going to like decide to like do some massive like fraud or massive like attack on the street they would have a lot of ability to do that as well so it's not what's the difference it right. doesn't matter if it occurs in in the, in the traditional wall street space or in the digital asset you know the 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 uh modern you know digital asset space the modern like investment space uh, so one of the things that I think is sort of comical is that when people try to attack the space, they try to talk about these problems. Oh, you know, use too much energy. Like that that argument was comical. Now, I agree that proof of work is not the best consensus mechanism, and I, that's no problem there. But like when you look at it in a larger scale, every problem that exists in traditional spaces uh, can, in theory, exist in the blockchain space and less do. So like you're going to use traditional attacks to attack this like a new technology. It's not even new anymore. It's been a decade. So, so like, you know, like I don't I think it's sort of comical when you see people like when you saw Elon Musk discussing how Bitcoin is bad for the environment. Like what a farce. And, 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 and I'm not a Bitcoin guy. I, I'm not. I'm, not. I, I'm, a, I'm a smart contract enabled blockchain network guy. It's, it's, so it's, it's just sort of comical. I'm, I'm an Ethereum maximalist, man. <laughs> I'm not even like, exactly uh, me too. <laughs> I, I'm not even, I don't even feel ashamed to say it anymore. Like I just like no. That, that, you should, first of all, you should not be. I, I honestly think what you're going to see is that um, Bitcoin and Ethereum could be a store of value, like gold, right? But people don't buy stuff with gold. <laughs> it's not like I go to my like pizza place and I buy pizza with gold, right? That's exactly. its own thing, and and you, like that's you you wouldn't even do it back in like the gold standard days. No, no, it's nonsense. Like, but like the other thing is when you look at Ethereum and its progeny, right? Uh, that's where I think the real innovation will occur. I think that the development of smart contract enabled blockchains and uh, parachain networks and really layer two technology and the like is where all the innovation and like the special sauce is going to happen. I mean, so some people would even say that because you know the Talib argument is that. I just coined that term. Like the Taleb argument is basically that once the BTC network doesn't have it, is not producing any more Bitcoin, then the miners don't have any reasonable reason to keep securing the network because it's just going to turn out expensive and a waste of energy. But in the end of the day, that problem sort of gets surpassed if you just wrap all the BTC and you put it on the Ethereum network, right? Exactly. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, look, yeah. look, listen, people use. People use Bitcoin and DeFi with wrapped Bitcoin. Like it's yeah. the same concept there. It, it, this, I think the same thing will happen. Is that, and I, 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 listen, the, the question is, and like there's some, I think it's sort of like a, it's not that complicated of an argument to say, oh, there's no more mining rewards and therefore they're going to have to switch to some sort of transactional validation model where the miners get paid in transaction fees and that might be difficult for them. Okay, big deal. <laughs> like, like, like the concept of, like, and I sound like I'm a Bitcoin maximalist and I'm really, really not. I'm like, I'm like, so not. But like the concept of what people believe has value and what stores value, that's on them to believe. It's the same, it's it, it, what is valuable, what people believe is valuable. What is something worth what you could sell it for? It's the same, it's like, these are basic tenets here. That's what I wanted to say. Do you follow, uh, you look like you do. Do you follow Nick Carter on Twitter? I, I'm not a Twitter person. I don't, I'm not a social media person. Lucky so you, like man. I don't I don't uh, have a that, Twitter. That's a rabbit hole I should have I never have... into. Well, not just that. Like for me, like I think it's dangerous in general from a mental health perspective. Because think about this: like most people want have, want want followers. Like why why do I need followers? Why do I need people to follow me to make me feel good about what I do? Now it's a great means of 
business development if you're using it for that. But I'm not trying, I don't think people should follow me. I don't think I should follow anyone. That's my whole thought process there. And I think that uh, the way it works, particularly if you go down the rabbit hole, like it's all meant to evoke some sort of like reaction in your brain that makes you feel good. It has some sort of response that's almost like narcotics and it, it's very dangerous. I it's engineered. It's engineered all the way down to make it uh, to make you addicted. That's the worst part. Like um, they're doing the same thing to us that the cigarette industry did. Meanwhile, they just claim right over social issues and and to impose their viewpoints on us in, in a certain way, don't they? I, I don't really wait, listen like the social issues is its own can of worms and I have nothing to say about it <laughs> but not, not even like but like the more the, the larger thing is if I thought of my children like I don't want them to be a follower of anyone I don't want them to be a follower I want them to be a leader like 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 the whole concept itself is weird and uh it's I don't know I think it's changing rapidly and we'll see what happens I know that like if you look at the news recently like like Facebook and Twitter are putting out massive numbers because there's been so much marketing done in the last quarter because everything's online to like the, the transition to online everything has rapidly increased since covid and you know they're in a good position for that but um i don't know I, you know when you're in the space for a long time in the beginning people are talking about decentralized uh social networks and you've seen like i think eos tries to do something like that and there's other companies that are, like have discussed it and uh it's sort of uh it's sort of ironic when when facebook wants to enter the space because of their love of controlling data uh yeah, exactly <laughs> uh, and and vitalik to, to, touched this touched this again in the last on the last conference in paris he also hammered away the point that decentralized social media should be a thing and that they want to build it in ethereum and all this um it's interesting to see how this would look like and see how the policing of these structures would look like. But I was asking you if you follow Nick Carter on Twitter because he should a very good take on this. And um, that is... Is Nick very... Carter Aaron Carter's brother? I'm joking. That's a celebrity <laughs> everyone. <funny. laughs> yeah, I think his name's I, actually Nick Carter I, I, too. I, I, I <laughs> the, he, he, wasn't there another celebrity called Nick Carter as well? But Nick Carter with a K. CK. Yeah, I mean... I mean I'm making a crappy old man joke, so I apologize. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't feel anyone should feel ashamed for for a crappy old man joke. Um, so, <laughs> but if we, I mean, the, the the point that he was trying to make, and the point that sort of defeats the whole this whole like people prosecuting Bitcoin for wasting too much money, is that in the end of the day, everything wastes quote unquote electricity everything consumes electricity right like we're consuming electricity here your microphone your earphones your phone all the lights that i have here my camera everything everything consumes electricity right so we just deem what is worthwhile to waste electric again quote unquote electricity on on a very mm -hmm. arbitrary network on a very arbitrary conception of what we think is worthwhile for humanity or for whatever and so basically what these people are trying to say is like the decentralized money have not has no value and that therefore any electricity that's worth that's used for that is completely wasted and i, I guess like a good question for you right now would be coming from wall street how, how do you see all these regulatory threats that are coming up these days how, how do you feel about those do you think there's any substance to them or are they just like trying to see if they hit something no i mean i'm just trying to make sure i made my microphone louder i think i did um <laughs> but okay good um listen um when it comes to the blockchain space and that's a very catch-all term Regulation has been coming for a very long time. It, it, it was never not here. It just wasn't clearly enforced. Uh, I, I think that that question you're asking is sort of deals with multiple issues. First, like the, the general antitrust, anti-big tech issue, right? And second is like the blockchain space and how that should be regulated. Now, the general big tech, uh, uh, you know, anti-monopoly stuff, that's for people to decide. In all honesty, like 
you can make a significant argument and a legitimate argument that tech has gotten too powerful and there needs to be some uh, <laughs> decentralization of authority within the tech space. But at the same time, the same thing. I, I, I like this beer kid that. <laughs> <laughs> But the same things happened in American history multiple times. It happened with the oil companies. It happened with the, with the self with excuse me with the, uh, the 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 phone companies with AT and T and the baby bells and everything like that. And uh, I think it's just a matter of a, of a natural pattern where you have an industry that emerges and that industry becomes very very powerful. And don't forget, you can argue big te big tech's been here since two thousand, right? Like since you have like. Internet 2.0, I guess you would call it, where people actually use the internet beyond like Netscape. I guess the beginning of that's arguably the social media era, like where people are actually using applications on the internet, right? But like, and they've had time to get very powerful and it's okay. Like it, it's not necessarily bad. It's just not necessarily good either. And I think we're at the part of this, uh, of the specter or the part of the cycle, I should say, where, uh, there will be some challenges to these sort of monopolistic practices. Now, on the other side of that, when we're talking about the blockchain space, uh, our whole thesis since we started this company is that the federal securities laws provide the best framework to regulate digital assets. Uh, and we started the company in 2017, but we originally got into the space, uh, myself and our chairman and my co-CEO, who's my brother, Benjamin, uh, and we wrote a no action letter to the SEC in 2014, basically saying, should we trade virtual currency in a brokerage account through an alternative trading system, right? Basically, it would be regulated. It would be, they would have the fair and orderly markets. So it had full and fair disclosure. It would have the investor protections, all the things that are really important because these are mandated under federal securities laws uh, that, that they would not take action against us. So basically, you're saying, like, if we do this, will you not take action, right? And it was always our belief that the federal securities laws provide these frameworks. And even though it's been a long time, <laughs> it's been seven, eight years now, right? Like, uh, it's been very validating that I think we're at that finish line where like everyone sort of understands that the federal securities laws uh, are likely to be the parameters by which all these activities are regulated. Uh, the most important or the first like sort of like guidepost or signpost the SEC put out was the Dow report in July 2017. And if you remember the Dow with Ethereum, like it, it, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting like case study. It's an interesting business study and like the history of stuff. But like the reality is, is that what the Dow report basically said is that depending on the facts and the circumstances, the federal securities laws can be implicated in every part of the process of a digital asset, from the creation to the trading to the processing to like custody, everything. The Blockchain People podcast is brought to you by Coin Payments, the world's first and leading crypto payment processor. Coin Payments serves over 70,000 merchants in over 200 nations with industry low fees since 2013. The Coin Payments wallet lets users hold over 2,000 different cryptocurrencies, which is why they're used by giants such as NordVPN and Binance. Whether you're a merchant or an individual looking to get paid in crypto, Coin Payments could be just what you need. We were talking about the Dow thing. So yeah, so basically in July 2017, you have the Dow report come out and it's the first time that the SEC really comments on the general state of the digital asset, crypto, uh, blockchain industry. And what they say is, let me take a step back. What the Dow report was is the decentralized autonomous organization. They raised money to do a project that was supposed to be a new type of corporate governance mechanism. And there was some sort of issue and there was a hack. And the hack led to, I think, something, let's say $75 million worth of Ethereum or the like. I'm not exactly sure being taken or stolen. And uh, the, to my understanding, what happened is, is there, that, that led to a fork occurring on the Ethereum network. And that's how you have the creation of, I, my understanding is Ethereum Classic is the people who didn't go with the fork. And then you have normal Ethereum continuing there. Exactly. But and with the DAO, DAO, what ends up happening is... Um, uh, and this DAO was sort of set up to be a sort of like a venture capital fund, a little venture capital fund that was like operating in a DAO manner, completely decentralized. A lot of people within Ethereum, like including the Ethereum funders, had like funds in there, which made it like extra suspicious for those people that didn't go, they didn't agree with the fork, that they were forking things away to like 
dilute uh, to, to sort of like cancel out what happened in with within the DAO and with the hack and all that. They basically reversed back as if it never happened, which made a lot of people angry, which then like raised the concerns and led to this report by the SEC that you're mentioning. Yeah, I mean, going to the point you're making, because you understand the crux of the specific issues that are important is the question is like, would that have occurred had should had it been not related to the Ethereum founders? Because then it becomes a question of control over the network and really the idea of decentralization of a large as in a larger idea. Now, like, listen, like my assessment and like my real assessment is that the Ethereum guys are probably like the best guys in the industry, some of the best guys, because uh, they've done an excellent job, but that's not relevant to what we're talking about in the security sense, because this is where the SEC comes in, and this is their first, like, I would argue the first big release in this space, and they've had minor ones before that, but this is, they basically say is that anyone involved with the life cycle of a digital asset could implicate the federal securities laws. And specifically what it says is depending on the facts and circumstances, uh, the activities related to, at the time it wasn't called digital assets, but to whatever we want to say tokens, uh, implicate, could implicate the federal securities laws. Now, if you cut through the legalese there, what they really said is that uh, a good percentage of, and this is my interpretation, this is not an official interpretation, but a good percentage, uh, arguably a very high percentage of digital assets uh, activities and related activities and processes implicate the federal securities laws. Uh, when if you take a step deeper in sort of that analysis, what you're saying is that digital assets are often federal securities or are often securities. And if that if that happens, what that means is that there needs to be compliant mechanisms for the issuance, the trading, the clearance, settlement, and custody of digital assets under federal securities laws. So what ends up happening with us is after the Dow report came out, we were like, oh, this is wonderful. It's always been our thesis that the federal securities laws in the United States were the regulations that were going to allow digital assets to be a, a, a mainstream asset class. And this was the first time that there was a clear indicator that that's the way it was going to go. July 2017, we start Prometheum. And the idea there is to create an ecosystem that allows for the issuance, trading, clearance, settlement, and processing. And you're trying to integrate the investor protections and the regulations of, uh, attended to the federal securities laws into your ecosystem, no problem. But the other side of that is that the federal securities laws can allow for a digital asset to both be a compliant financial instrument, but also maintain its utility of the distributed economy. And I use this like a, my, the easiest example because it's, it's a known use case is Filecoin. Filecoin issued a Reg D security. Therefore, they're a security. But a Filecoin token, right? Uh, IPFS, I think it is, right? Like, uh, uh, maybe I'm messing up the name. But anywho. Um, yeah, I don't know the ticket right there. Anywho, what it basically allowed. Uh, am I right or am I not? I don't know. Doesn't matter. I don't know. If I'm not right, take this out, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but when you look at Filecoin, Filecoin is both a security, but it also has a utility in the distributed economy. So you'd, it allows people to store data on the Filecoin blockchain, right? So it needs, in, in order for digital assets to really to be allowed to be what they are and to be compliant in what they are, there needs to be a mechanism both for it to be a compliant financial instrument, but also for it to maintain its utility value, its ability to be used in different blockchains and different networks. And basically Prometheum, I think, provides a mechanism for that. And I think that's super important because we're seeing this conflation between an, an investable asset, but an asset that actually allows you to do something as well, like the combination between tech and securities. And I think it's super important to be able to do that. The regulation in general and how these things will be processed, but it goes back to the first point I was making here in that it's super important. And I think it's essential for any ecosystem that's trying to do what we're doing to basically allow that token should have that characteristic of not just being a compliant financial instrument, because that's the base level. You have to do that. You have to be compliant under the regulations of your jurisdiction, but maintaining it's allowing it to maintain its utility value. The other thing here is when you think about the ecosystem we've been building is that 
So you build an ecosystem that leverages the benefits of distributed architectures and distributed ledger technology, right? And what that means is better record keeping. You know, you have a really better mechanism for uh, processing and settlement. So the way we do it or the way we anticipate doing it is an, is an asset is issued on a blockchain, it's distributed into wallets that exist on that blockchain, then it's listed onto a secondary market. In that secondary market, those trades that occur are written to the blockchain, right? And the way we will do it in the future is that we'll reconcile those trades against the settlement transaction at the, at the custody, right? And what you'll do that basically through some smart contract component there, right? And what that means is that you don't have the problems with traditional securities and that you don't have the issue where you're going to have so many trade breaks, when you're going to have errors occur in the trading life cycle, where you're going to have busted trades because it's, it basically leverages the benefits of what exactly blockchains are to basically create a better Apple card there. Now, this is a bit of a circuitous way of explaining it, but what that allows for is not just us to be able to service digital assets like the you know, utility tokens or Reg D tokens or actual like tokens. It actually also, allowed, we realized after is that we create an ecosystem that's just a better processing mechanism and a better just general cycle and ecosystem, Apple cart, whatever you want to call it, for securities in general. It's not just digital assets, but this is traditional securities. And what I think you're also going to see is you're going to see traditional securities migrate to a blockchain because it's just better. It's just more efficient. It's better record keeping. It's less expensive. All these other things that will basically like just create a better mechanism for it. So what I think started as one thing for us in the sense that we want to build an ecosystem after the Dow report came out that basically creates a compliant mechanism for the issuance transaction and processing of digital assets under federal securities laws. That was great. And by, by leveraging and actually integrating the benefits of blockchain technology in the process, what you're able to do is you just created a better apple cart, not just for digital assets, but for traditional securities too. So it was, it's very fascinating like that. And like, I think people who are probably smarter than I could have seen that in the sense when you started to see the Dow, the Dow the processing in general, when the Dow report came out and you had the implications of the, of the Dow report, but uh, it's been really, really fulfilling to like to just try to do something that maybe will upgrade and change markets. And I think that's like been really nice throughout the whole process. That's a great explanation of what the platform is. And I think um, on some level, the underlying assumption that, that the, like you said, the U.S. security definition is going to, is on its way to become the mainstream one. I think that's correct. And um, it might be a minor thing to just remind people this, but in the basic, in the more, in the most basic way, a security is an expectation to profit from someone else's efforts, right? And that is a what effectively happens with a lot of coins and with a lot of tokens. I mean, if I invest in BNB or if I buy a big bag of BNB, that's because. On some way or another, despite the fact that the coin does have an utility or, and that it does fulfill a mission on its blockchain, uh, on the very basic level, I'm expecting to profit from Binance's efforts, right? Uh, or and from Binance's road to becoming the biggest exchange in the world or whatever. So in some sense, there is always this security component going through. But I'm curious, what would you have to say to those that don't think that the U.S. should be the center of the world and its policy dictating what we all do in our decentralized ecosystems? Um, I, I would make a joke like... and say my favorite movie is Rocky IV, and I really like, and I really like the A Team, and Hulk Hogan's my favorite wrestler, and uh, I am a real American, and I fight for the rights of every man. That's his theme song. I'm joking around here, but uh, but essentially, what I would say to you is, uh, I don't believe, I, I don't believe as a general proposition that America is right all the time. I don't believe that it's necessarily the best all the time. But I will tell you, when it comes to markets, we do a pretty good job, and I don't necessarily think that it should necessarily it, it should be American markets. But the idea of investors being protected. The idea of investors having disclosures such that they can make proper decisions. The idea, the idea of just invest fair and orderly markets such that like markets aren't manipulated. When you look at 
a lot of the crypto exchanges, the SEC has, uh, at least from my assessment, has major issues by which the way they operate. Because the, I don't think there's protections to protect the average investors against manipulative trading. And uh, I don't, it, from obviously, we are American, it's an American company. I'm familiar with the American laws, but I don't care what the law would be. I just think that these things have to occur so in meaning like there needs to be integrity in all these systems in order for digital assets to go mainstream. And like we talk about like people on the other side, they talk about, oh, it's so wonderful, the democratization of finance, which is very important. And it's really important that people get banked. And I, I don't have any, like, I'm not, I, I agree with that. But on the other side, that is, you can't just have the democratization of finance in a system that has crap rules that basically are going to just like really end up screwing those people. It, it, you can't have that occur. It needs to be a system that has a, a, a integrity. It needs to be like a legitimate system. And I don't think they're perfect at all. They're not perfect. But compare it to any other jurisdiction. Like the, the only people you really can compare it to are you going to compare it to the continental European models? Because we're under the same common law as the British and the Canadian and the Australians. Or are you going to compare it to, and I believe that the Japanese model is initially is, is, is created off the continental model uh, uh, the continental European model. And when you get compared to the, the markets in other parts of Asia, I, I think it, the American rules might not be a perfect solution, but they provide the best parameters to create a system where there's going to be markets that are legitimate. And, and it's super important. And uh, it's just super important. And it doesn't have to be the American rules. It's just super important that there are legitimate markets for people to, to participate in. Because it's oppressive if you create markets and basically introduce these people to markets and they just get screwed. It's just not appropriate. So I, I think that the American rules provide uh, a very good solution to that, particularly compared to other options out there. I, uh, I would have to very strongly disagree with you. I really think that Rocky one is the best one of all of them, uh, but <laughs> living a, uh... Leaving the best <laughs> film of all times aside. <laughs> I, I would think that... First of all, when Apollo dies, I cried. I cried. But like, uh, <laughs> the, 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 don't get me started with Apollo dying. Don't... <laughs> I just don't think the whole thing was, whole, was handled like, on the level that Apollo deserved. Um, I, 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 just, I just revisited all of them, man, like a month ago. It I was agree. Like the agree. best month of my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I would I would really like to to talk about the mini IPO now man because like the reg, reggae <laughs> not not related to reggae music uh, since we're making that jokes no, not bad not bad not bad man um, if we did your version of yeah of an IPO on the blockchain and um, that is fully compliant with the SEC models but I guess that you would be way better at explaining it than me so do you want to give it a go and do you want to explain a bit the rationality behind the behind setting up this model on the blockchain if there is anything that you haven't covered before about that so when you look at reggae plus reggae plus just provides a mechanism by which you can issue publicly free tradable securities and i think that what's really important there in the blockchain space particularly is that tokens are in my opinion regulated digital assets and basically securities And they need to be issued under a mechanism by which they could be freely tradable in order such that people can do validation or mining or airdrops or the like. And basically also in, uh, participants in the ecosystem, not just investors in speculative sense, can then have liquidity such that they can cash out of you know, the, uh, the payment or the reward they get for providing service on that network. Uh, so I think that it's very important, particularly as we move from, as we transition from a pseudo regulator or a regulated space to a fully regulated space that we have a mechanism for uh, there to be a compliant means for them to issue digital assets that could be traded publicly and Reg A plus provides that and I think is a good solution there. I also want to say that regular plus is not the only option like Reg A plus is just one of the numerous options of doing a uh, registration of a security or an exemption such that it's freely trading 
Uh, and basically, I think that's what's going to be required across the board, whether it's an S1 or an S4 or the like, uh, in order for digital assets to go mainstream. Because, uh, again, I believe that digital assets are compliant financial instruments, but also uh, they have to be, there has to be a mechanism for them to maintain their utility in the distributed economy and doing it. Well, that's a very interesting point that you touch on, because you say that you believe that all tokens should be classified as securities. So I wonder where that puts the utility token as a concept in your mind. I mean, we were talking about Ethereum and we were talking about the whole um, about the whole way that the SEC reacted to the DAO. And I remember that Ethereum itself had to be very careful about the way it issued its um, its token, being one of the very first ACOs, the biggest one at the time. The the one that sort of led the way to raise funds in this manner and you would see that they had to go to lawyers they had to get letters of approval they had to do everything basically to not get thrown in jail for trying to launch a token including not doing the ico in the united states so do you think the utility token should completely disappear no absolutely not i think what a utility token is is a new type of security It allows it to be a compliant financial instrument, but instead of it just being a representation of the P&L of the company, it's a representation of the network growth. The value of a utility token in a, in a proper ecosystem that has reasonable token economics and, and incentive mechanisms is that it should reflect the, the network growth, the actual protocol growth. And it's a means of having a reflection of that to begin with. It, it's just a different means of having a return. So I don't think that the federal securities laws are prohibitive here. I think what they do is provide a mechanism for everything to go mainstream. And the other thing is that I'm not like, I'm not trying to say that the federal securities laws are the be all and end all of everything. What I'm trying to say is that they're probably the best solution. And when you hear about people calling for new laws and new regulations about how, how crypto and tokens should be treated, uh, I don't think it's the it shows the deepest understanding of how laws work in the United States or how regulations work. And I think what's much more likely is you're, you're, you're likely to see the uh, SEC change the definition of, a, or the, the, excuse me, the Congress change the definition of security to include digital assets and the like. Now that can include uh, tokens, that can include uh, stable coins, that can include DeFi products. That could also include virtual currency. I don't know how that's going to play out, but if you're trying to read the way the tea leaves are playing out, uh, it would appear to me that the best framework to regulate digital assets as a whole is the federal securities laws. So let's say the SEC goes and turns uh, everything into a security. Uh, all the digital assets, all these tokens, everything. And this is just a thought exercise. We're not saying that this is going to happen. This is not saying that. <laughs> I'm, I'm protecting you from your own lawyers. Um, but <laughs> uh, we're, we're not saying that this is going to happen. Carlos, so, Carlos, I am my own lawyer. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but <it's not> a, <laughs> I'm, I'm a security from yourself attorney. Now. But, no, no, I, I mean, like, listen, like, I, I get it. it. But one of the issues in the space in general, in my opinion, is there is this aversion to regulation to begin with in general. And like what you have is you have like uh, really talented developers and really talented engineers and the engineers drive a lot of this growth and they just want a, the, the least resistant path to being able to generate a return on their work. But then you have the larger entities, the VCs and the related entities who for a very long time said tokens weren't securities, they were utilities, which I mean, it might sound nice. And they also said that uh, innovation was killed by regulation. And that's true maybe in a very early uh, nascent stage for these type of companies. But in order for Uh, virtual currency, digital assets, stable coins, tokens, the like, whatever you want to say, to go, to be able to be used by the average person, to be a, an asset class that people don't have to worry necessarily about nefarious things. They have to comply with regulation. And obviously I'm a regulation guy, but I'm not trying to say that because it just serves my purpose. It's just the reality of what has to occur in the coming quarters 
in order for this digital asset quote unquote revolution to you know to reach the uh, reach the apex of what it needs to do. So uh, I guess the question that I had before it's uh, and that you partially answered there was that what would happen if, for example, the SEC declares that all of these uh, companies or projects that have issued uh, tokens that are classified as utilities right now, let's say to name one as an example, Uniswap, let's say that they classify the Uni token as a security and therefore they declare that the token offering for Uniswap token was illegal. I mean, Uni token might not be the best one for this example, but let's just- No, no, it's a good example. No, no, it, it genuinely, listen, like the, the Uniswap, swap, uh, uh, the Uniswap stuff, that's a bit hard to say. Um, and and the different layers, the different tokens, everything like that. I think it's a good example in certain certain capacities in that like uh, there are potential securities implications there. And you're saying, what would happen if all of a sudden they became subject to securities rules? Now, it's not just on the front of, okay, the Uniswap token and how that works, but it's also about the smart contracts that provide investment opportunities to people who use, you know, DeFi products, right? right? So it's not just on like the registration side, it's actually what they're doing. Now, on the registration side, you know, who knows, what's, who knows what will happen? Maybe there'll be a grandfather opportunity where companies that did it before a certain date have the ability to, you know, fall into line and there won't be any sort of action against them. That might be a possibility here, but Again, the other part of that, though, is is like companies in the regulated space who have been trying to do it in a compliant manner often uh, meet different difficulties because they are actually regulated. And they're trying to do it compliantly. Now, what the way it gets solved in the longer term is that these all these all that all these activities become regulated activities, and I think that's just a matter of time, particularly in the DeFi space. Um, but uh, <laughs> They'll be, I don't think the, and this is a good way to explain, I think, is that I don't think that the step where you get to the point where you can have these regulated activities occur in a compliant manner can occur unless you get the companies like Uniswap and you get the, like, you know, the first movers in the space that basically explain how it should be done, maybe from a, from a business standpoint, but not necessarily from a compliance standpoint. So uh, it's almost like a chicken and egg scenario here. Right. And in this chicken and egg scenario, let's say, continuing with the example of Uniswap, if they don't allow any grandfather opportunities, like you said, if there is like a very clear line that, okay, you did something illegal and you have to be prosecuted for that. Is there, fun also for people like me that watch too many TV shows, uh, is there a way to them like avoid getting into jail by not traveling to the United States or by, uh, is, is this like prosecuted like worldwide by the- no, um, What is this? This is, these are narco traffic contests. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know <laughs> how like, like, works. I don't like, understand. Like, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, if, it, I mean, but if, if you deal narcotics, you're dealing with a different regime. I mean, like, here's my point. I think there'll be opportunities for the entities that are in that sort of situation. And I'm not saying that anyone is, but the entities in that situation to basically have some sort of means to remediate whatever they're doing. They already have high market caps and it makes sense considering they have big investors in order for them to like make themselves uh, do whatever they have to do to continue operating. Right. It's just how it's going to go. There's no issue with that. And like, Everyone seems to be like the United States is not trying to, at least in my opinion, is not trying to oppress founders and engineers. They're not. They're just trying to make sure that the people here are protected and then investors don't get screwed. And that's what you need. And I, and I don't think there's any problem with that at all. I really don't. Well, and you, I, I mean, I'm giving you an easy, uh, an easy one here for you like, with your experience, but wouldn't you say that investors have a right to get screwed or to learn their own lessons the hard way? No, no, you're saying caveat emptor. That's a, a legal concept of buyer beware. And you're right in a certain respect. If I go to buy a house and I don't do an inspection and then I move into the house and I, and basically my house is much less quality than I thought, that's on me. But this right. is different because when you have an investment to begin with, right, the idea is there needs to be full and fair disclosure. So what does that mean cutting like actually and specifically? 
full and fair disclosure means disclosure of all material facts and not omitting any fact that someone might consider as material. A material fact is something that someone might consider important when making an investment decision. So like there needs to be a standard mechanism by which investors have a disclosure document where people seeking to raise money by issuing some sort of token actually disclose what they have to. There needs to be a specific process, a compliant process by which that occurs. And the U.S. First Federal Securities Laws provide that. Like that's what that's the whole part of registering a security. It, it's just how it works. So like I understand that it makes things a little bit more difficult in the sense that companies just can't raise money without actually doing the legal work and the 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 disclosure work required in order to make sure that their documents are compliant. But at the same time, like if they don't do that, the people who end up getting hurt in these processes are investors. And, and, and that's also bad for the industry. So if these processes, if these standardized processes of disclosure and investor protection and really required processes related to investor protection are integrated in the process, I think it actually helps the industry. Do you think that this is like the regulation thing? That do you think it could be something like... Uh when we're talking happiness and when we're talking religion or everything, that people are using the same word, thinking it means the same, but it means different things to different people. Uh, I think that that's the way the world works on many fronts. Yeah, maybe, uh, because the feeling that I get when I talk to people that are in regulation is that everyone sort of would agree on the same talking points. It's just because everyone like projects different ideas or different insecurities into the same oh, you're words. totally right you're totally right and that's an excellent observation carlos and what i would say is that if you ask a bunch of people what does liquidity mean like what does liquidity genuinely mean so if you looked at robin but robin hood's quote unquote had a potential liquidity crisis when they had to do when they shut the uh when they shut trading during the you know the uh uh the gamestop reddit type days right uh -huh. but what does liquidity mean Like liquidity means that there should be a ready amount of buyers and sellers. There should be depth of the book, but like that's just one way to interpret liquidity. And I think what you're referring to there is the same concept in that like people don't really understand. They think they understand these concepts, but they don't really get it to the point they should. So the way I would describe it, the, the, the general parameters I would state here is that in order for the whole blockchain space to go mainstream, which it's already started, There needs to be regulation, and regulation means that there's standardized procedures by which uh, disclosure documents are created. There's standardized mechanisms by which uh, digital assets are traded, and basically people have to trust those things. And I think that the transition has been going on for a while, and it'll continue to happen, and we'll see in the coming months what happens on the larger scale of how are digital assets truly going to be treated? Like it's, we're moving away from these ambiguities to like specific regulations, not necessarily new regulations, but existing regulations, which will lay out how the processes should occur related to uh, a lot of the uh, components and a lot of the, a lot of just the activities related to digital assets. I guess that also a lot of, people where that come from bitcoin originally that are more like the libertarian anarchist type they would what they hoped would happen with this is that we would see sort of like a parallel monetary system where the governments don't have a say right so they tend to get frustrated when they see regulators get involved or they see standardized procedures as, as you put it tried to be put into this whole thing. Oh, I agree with you totally. Like when I first got into the space, we were dealing in the crypto anarchist era where you had these like, you know, the cypherpunks, the crypto anarchists, and this kind of thing. It was like the existing regulations and the architectures by which society regulates us don't serve the purposes we need. And what blockchain and crypto will enable is us to transcend these and create a better system. That argument in my mind is, is inherently flawed because in order for crypto to become this, you know, this, uh, this thing they wanted, they basically this alternative mechanism by which to do all these things, it would have had to be regulated from the first place. So by definition, it could never have been this libertarian, you know, 
caused it could never have been what the initial crypto punks wanted in the first place. It, it just never would have been there. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a uh, it's a result of its own success. The fact that Bitcoin, you know, at one point is worth a trillion dollars and like you have major market caps and all these other things. It's wonderful. And it, I think it really teaches people about different concepts, particularly when it comes to their understanding and their thoughts related to what is money? What is value? What are fiat dollars? But the other side of that is that in order for it to reach that point and to continue to grow, there needs to be established parameters and there needs to be regulations and the like, which basically make it difficult for libertarians to deal with in the first place. Okay, I'm going to see if I can very quickly find the tweet that I really like, and I, because I would really like to, to get your input into this. Because every time that I go into Reddit, or every time that I go into any of these platforms where crypto people are just let alone in our own eco bubble, you see that we have the, um, there's always the same talking points, and there's this feeling that Elizabeth Warren and the different regulators in space, they're just trying to shut down crypto or they're trying to threaten crypto because they feel like this is threatening the whole system, that, the legacy system that put them in that place in the first. I don't think, I don't think that that's, I understand that interpretation, but I don't necessarily think that's the proper analysis. And I think what Elizabeth Warren's saying, and we're, we're intimately familiar with everything she's saying because it sort of plays into her, our whole thesis, in that Elizabeth Warren in her recent letters and comments to Chairman Gensler from the SEC is basically saying, there needs to be regulation here. There needs to be clear parameters of regulation. Now, uh, Elizabeth Warren, by definition, is trying to be sensationalist because she's trying to get votes in some capacity. It's not really dealing with the, the, the specific issues. The specific issue in my mind is the clarity as to how this is regulated. Like the, and, and the way I think it should be regulated is that if you change the definition of a security, and I believe in the 1933 Securities Act, to include digital assets and have digital assets include virtual currency, stable coin, uh, <laughs> tokens, et cetera, et cetera, DeFi, like that will then bring everything under the purview of the SEC. And now you'll have a regulator who's really capable of regulating the industry. As it stands right now, I don't think the Money Service Bureau Money Transmitter Licensure is, uh, is necessarily the best regime to regulate virtual currency exchanges. And because there's just not the enforcement arm there. Whereas if the SEC regulated it, they would have the, the soldiers to basically make sure that everyone stayed kosher under the rules that the SEC laid out. So like, I think that Elizabeth Warren is progressing the issue forward, not necessarily in the best route, but she's doing an okay job in the sense that there needs to be regulation. I would argue that DeFi is undoubtedly a regulated activity and there needs to be mechanisms to make sure like the things I keep on mentioning, that investors are protection, that they have full and fair disclosure documents, and that the markets that they're trading on are legitimate, which is fair and orderly markets. And those are three of the tenets, basically three of the mandates of the SEC. And what's really important is that that's the way to basically introduce integrity into the system. That's why for, for you know almost a decade now, we've been arguing and we, we firmly believe in everything you've done, that the federal securities laws provide the best framework to regulate all these activities. Would you, I mean, with changing the definition of security, that, that will have to change the Howey test, the famous Howey test? Uh, no, um, no, no, not at all. Not at all? Because I would argue, no, I mean, I listen, a Howey test, an investment of money, an investment of money with the intention of profit primarily, primarily from the efforts of others. I'm very familiar with it, but like, why would that change things? A token is the same concept there. I would argue that like almost every token that exists meets that definition. So why would the definition have to be changed? It's just, it's just the same definition. It's a good test. It works out well. And I think basically they would, they would just have to examine these new considerations under that test. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that this is a, stra a streamlined argument, right? And this is, um, even if some people are not going to agree with your whole, whole thesis, um, they at least can agree that the reasoning is sound, right? And that the whole, um, the, the idea 
stands on its own feet. So I, I don't know if you want to expand on it in any other way, just to to keep uh, to keep rounding it up. No, I mean I think we've hit on the major issues here again. Like I'm not I, I'm not so far like a I'm not trying to be a person who's like this is the way we do it and this is the way it has to be done. I don't believe in that in general. But like I would say from our examination that we've been working on this very, very hard for a long time and just examining any potential options. My argument would be is that if you look at the potential alternatives and the potential ways forward, the best route forward is for all these activities to be regulated under the federal securities laws. Uh, it's the only, it's not the only way, but it's the best way in order to make sure that, that, that people don't get screwed. And not just that people don't get screwed, but that if you have these integrities associated with these, these assets and these products and these systems, it's the, probably the best way for digital assets to go mainstream, which is anyone who, it, it, it's not like I've been in the space for a really long time and I've, I, it's not like, it, like I, 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 it's not like I fight every day to make digital assets go mainstream, but I think it's super important. And I think it's what everyone has been, been speaking about and like sort of considering for, you know, uh, five, eight, 10 years now. So it, it, like, I think what's potentially holding the industry back is the fact that there has been this final declaration that these are the parameters and these are the regulations and these are the ways forward in terms of structures and frameworks, which would be under the federal securities laws. And once you have that, I think it'll allow the, the industry to say, okay, this is finally the clarity we needed and this is how we'll continue to move forward. In the, in the case of these regulations coming in place, um, that of course, that, that would position Prometheum very well to to be the leading platform when it comes to implementing this type of tokens and this type of securities. Would you see? How, how do you see the crypto ecosystem adapting to it? Because I reckon that that would make the general top ten projects, let's call them that, act very differently, and that would check up the top ten, right? It would be completely I don't know different. if I'd agree with that. I don't know if I agree with that. I agree. I, I would argue that um, the only thing that might make things difficult in that capacity is you would have a, a potential issue if Ethereum itself were declared a security. But as long as Ethereum itself were declared a security, I think everything would just, uh, it would work its way out you know, in over three to six months. And in the case that it did, if they made Ethereum a security, like it's just a question of the enforcement that they would do. If they just said, okay, Ethereum, we just say, we think you're security over the next two years, you have to do whatever's necessary to be compliant with securities laws. Maybe that works out differently. But if they said all of a sudden, you know, if they were trying to, to really uh, castrate Ethereum, that would be a problem because Ethereum in my mind is the spine for the whole industry. Everything else, if you're looking at it from an anatomy perspective, are sort of ribs that come out off Ethereum. But I don't think they're trying to do that. I don't, I don't think the United States is trying to do what China did when it came to the miners and the uh, OTC traders recently. I, don't think the, you know, I think the United States wants to support this. And I think that it's in, best, in our best interest in America to actually uh, allow... The United States to become a clear a place where there's clear regulations that allow distributed architectures, distributed ledger technologies, and the like to flourish. I really, I really subscribe to this idea that Ethereum is the backbone of the of the current crypto ecosystem, because if you see the developments and if you see the innovation that's happened, it's all based on Ethereum in a certain way, and I also think that it's like uninfor unfortunate that most people tend to measure the value of the blockchain industry off of Bitcoin's price. It would even seem like whether the industry progresses or not, it's only a matter of the price of Bitcoin for certain people. And do you think there is a legal ground for a flippening of sorts to happen in this, in this regard? Does that question make any sense? Uh, no, I see what you're saying, man. I think I think it's already been happening for months. I don't think that the mainstream coverage has gone to the point. The mainstream media coverage has gone to the point where people realize that Ethereum is going to be more important in the long term than Bitcoin. But 
I just, I just don't see it occurring any other way. And uh, I think that people who are into the real technological components and the solutions that are provided by uh, smart contract enabled network and networks and, and, you know, the other innovations that are occurring in the Ethereum universe. Uh, and obviously smart contract enabled networks aren't brand new. They've been around for a while now, but like, that's where I think like the real unique innovations will occur over the course of five years. So uh, if you read Goldman Sachs reports recently, I also believe they've been coming out with reports with similar concept, uh, similar statements saying how, uh, Ethereum might overtake the price of Bitcoin in the long term. But again, I, I'm not a trader. I, I'm not trying to trade these things in and out. I, I'm a believer in Ethereum. I'm a believer in smart contract enabled blockchain networks. And I'm a believer in uh, that universe. Uh, I think that from a larger, you know, 10,000 foot view, uh, what Bitcoin is supposed to do is serve a different purpose. And uh, I would encourage everyone who wants to get into this space and wants to learn more to read the Ethereum Homestead document and really use that as almost your Bible that you can then extrapolate from there and really learn about the industry and see where all the projects have come from there and sort of get a roadmap of how things occur, sort of put the jigsaw puzzle together. I also don't think that we have many traders listening to this channel. I mean, in general, I try to keep the conversations very off the price of assets, very off these kind of things, because I just don't see much fun or much value in discussing assets that are, or asset prices that are all correlated to Bitcoin anyways. Um, I think, uh, I mean, we had our technical difficulties here, man, but I really, I really enjoyed this conversation. We're really welcome to come back anytime. Um, this was a lot of fun. I reckon that I put you through a bunch of hard questions as well. So is there anything that you'd like to say to the audience before we, before we finish this? Uh, nothing I can really think of, Carlos. Thank you so much for the opportunity, man. And I also appreciate this conversation as well. It, you can always tell by the type of questions people ask, whether they understand the larger issues here and like really the, uh, the stuff that occurs in between the lines. And if you think about it from an anatomy perspective, like you have your, you have your bones and you have your, you know, in the different bones, but it's really the ligaments that make everything come together. And these type of conversations discuss those ligaments. And like, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate what you're doing and keep up, uh, keep fighting the good fight, man. I don't think we've ever said the word ligaments in this podcast. So that's also like a high note to, <laughs> to end this <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. You're always welcome to come back. Yeah, cheers, Carlos. And if you're ever in New York, man, hit me up and we'll hang out. Definitely. And well, for people that want to learn more about Promethium, you can go to their website at promethium.com. Um, you can also see all the content that they're putting out on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Telegram during their channel. And I hope to hope that you, that you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you very much.